questions, numbers will be on your screen. Seven hundred. Great time here to get planned up. Oh, there's Dennis. Seventy question. Hello and welcome to Ask the. I'm your host Shelley Irwin, and tonight we will be talking with local sustainability experts. Joining us. Vice Chair of USGBC West Michigan, Steve Willoughby. Glad you're here. Association Property Director for Grand Rapids YMCA, Brett Butler. Many YMCAs you have, thanks to what you do. Pete Mitchell, you are for, from Rockford Construction. Thanks for your talents. And Jim Horman, glad you're here as well from Design Plus, 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 plus. Appreciate what you do. All right, gentlemen. Why green buildings would be our theme for the special edition of ASTA. And let me start with the, the basic question of how you spend your day. And let's start with you, Steve. Uh, my name is Steve Willoughby. I work on a lot of redevelopment projects throughout the state of Michigan. So a lot of my day is spent working with developers who are frustrated with site design, site planning issues, and really want to pursue financial incentives. And through that, really, a lot of sustainable components have come about. So. That's really my day, is working with developers on getting things to come out of the ground. Great. Brett? Well, as the property director for the YMC of Greater Grand Rapids, I spend about half of my time right now on the development of our new Spartan Stores YMCA project in Wyoming, and the other half of my time working on sustainability and operations at our existing Ys throughout the Grand Rapids area. Hmm. Pete, what's your day like? Uh, I'm a project manager for Rockford Construction, and uh, my day, there's probably no two days are the same, which is kind of the beauty of things. and I from anywhere from if a project is in pre-construction, um, working through the design with architects, um, go to regular meetings and work through the design process. And with a project that's in construction, we will, uh, like Brett's, the, YM, the Spartan Stores YMCA, we um, construction meetings, just coordinate um, schedules and um, do that with various projects that I'm Great. managing. Jim. Same thing as Pete. We have uh, a lot of work at our office that's architecturally and master plan related. So. I do a lot of front-end design work where sustainability is at the forefront of our programming. Mm -hmm. So a lot of design work for me, uh, business development, and then managing the uh, architectural staff. Right. Let's ask you to start the conversation, okay. Steve. Why focus on green buildings in this uh, 21st century? Now, why focus on green buildings? Green buildings has really evolved from a, a two, two perspectives. One would be from an ideological perspective if it's the right thing to do and the second would be from a energy or business perspective. And those are the two factors that have really driven uh, to the dialogue and the conversation surrounding sustainability and whether or not it should be incorporated into projects. Uh, often it's framed in a context of uh, it's liberal it's, or it's conservative and that's your perspective. But a lot of people look at it from a standpoint, is it the right thing to do? Is it something that we should be doing? Where others are really focusing on it from a perspective of, can it save me money if I'm operating my structure or how I'm doing business? So when those two began to really blend, that's when we began to see a movement. And that's why it continues today. People feel it's the right thing to do. And they feel good about what they're doing. And we're seeing it change with our kids from uh, recycling becoming common practice and so forth. But the business person is saying, OK, I need to reduce my energy costs. You know, Buildings are huge uh, CO2 emissions, water consumers. Uh, so they began to say, how can I lower my operating costs? And they can do that through sustainability. So that's when it began to, to really hit home from a Main Street perspective, is from uh, the, really the colliding of those two worlds for the best. I trust it's important to the mission of the US Green Building Council? Uh, very important. I mean, the USGBC was created in 1998. And the mission was to bring sustainable building uh, within a generation. And it continues to do that. We're seeing a lot of growth uh, within, I mean, the Grand Rapids market has been phenomenal. I, if I'm correct, 68 buildings alone uh, within Grand Rapids, that doesn't take into consideration the outlying areas, but 68 alone. And if you look at the state, there's uh, over 200. So if you look at that, that type of proportional distribution that's here, it, it's just phenomenal. And the USGBC is. I'm proud to be a part of that and to see it become much more than just an organization, but something mm -hmm. that building owners and building practitioners are doing. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, just a question for all of you. Would you agree that West Michigan would be considered a hub, a mecca for green buildings? Start with you, Brett. Absolutely. That uh, the, uh, the amount of concentration per capita 
I believe Grand Rapids is tied for first in the nation in the uh, density of green buildings. And certainly with leaders in the community like Fred Keller and others, uh, Peter Cook, that are really leading the way towards these types of developments. <coughs> Not to mention the hunting family that um, you know, founded our downtown facility. These are all very important attributes that they're uh, really moving forward with in this community. Yes, him and Pete, I, understand, I trust uh, you're, you feel blessed to work in this, oh, this area. And I, I think Brett touched on a great point, the whole philanthropic um, philosophy in, in the Grand Rapids market has really driven a large part of um, you know, the, the, the USGBC and the green explosion here in, in Grand Rapids. So I think that's been a big part of it. Right. Um, so it is, and it. it's leadership. This yep. community has pushed leadership to the forefront that has valued that. And it's enabled us to do our jobs so that we can pull any of the sustainable platforms to the programming early on when we're doing our We, It's nice that this is so applicable to all of the project types that we've worked on. We've, we've done everything from senior housing to recycling centers to, I mean, you name it, we've covered it with uh, this LEED platform and, and uh, just being sustainable. Ah, LEED, L-E-E-D. What is well, it, Steve? Raise, uh, yeah. Great point, so, leadership. Uh -huh. Leadership in energy and environmental design, and that's a key part of it. Uh, LEED, the U.S. Green Building Council was the organization that created LEED, so often when people see the USGBC, they don't put the two together. They, they think they're separate organizations or they think the U.S. Green Building Council is a, uh, a company that does sustainable weatherization, things of those natures. But they are very intertwined. I mean, the lead came from the U.S. Green Building Council, which is a grassroots organization. I mean, the criteria, the rating system that lead is, and what a lot of the projects we're discussing or we'll discuss today, is a rating system that takes a look at what are the sustainable components and how they benefit that development. And as a result of those improvements, uh, can either occur in a certified silver, uh, gold, or platinum rating. Uh, so it's really, as you stated, it's a leadership of a building owner, uh, the contractor such as Rockford, coming in and saying, we're going to do this project. It's going to be to a lead standard. And they determine it. And then through that leadership, the team works together to make sure that those credits or those rating systems are obtained to result in a sustainable project. Yeah, let's continue this topic. I mean, I trust buildings. The question is, why should buildings uh, go with the lead? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons why buildings should go with lead. It's, um, it, it's a lot of values. And, and the nice part about the lead system, the rating system, is, is that building owners, building managers, building designers can choose the particular values that they want to use in the lead system to enhance the value to their customer or to the owner. And so you have uh, values anywhere from the efficiency in, in the building, which is uh, savings to the bottom line, as well as contributing to sustainability for the planet, um, all the way to indoor air quality. And that goes to the health of individuals and to durability of finishes. And, and so there's, there's just a, a wide range of issues that you can really use that system to highlight within your building. In, in the YMCA, uh, we have three pillars, and, and youth development, uh, social responsibility, and healthy living. And so LEED fits very nicely with two of our three pillars, social responsibility for leaving the planet in at least as good a condition, if not better condition, for those that come after us. Uh, and, and in the healthy living, certainly creating a healthy environment for people to come and participate in our activities to improve their overall physical health is a great component for us. Great. Rockford Construction, where does LEED play its role? Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's, uh, we're one of the largest uh, green builders in, in the state of Michigan and certainly West Michigan. We've been just blessed to be involved in all of these projects, and, and it's really just a dynamic, and we've watched it. We've grown with it, um, with the process. We've watched the process evolve, and we've just had a great opportunity to work on a lot of different projects. And it's just the first art museum in the world, first church in the world, so just been pretty cool. Yes. It's, it's really been enjoyable. Not going away, is it, Jim? Nope. No, the art museum is mm -hmm. a great example. Yeah. I mean, if you can apply this to that and the recycling center that we've done together, that's a, that's a good platform. We really push sustainability in the architectural engineering um, area arena for all of our projects and have for 20, 30 years, the 30 years of Design Plus. Uh, I think it's come out now where we have something to measure it against. So our philosophy is sustainability and making it so that we love the planet, but this is a way for us to be efficient, to decrease operating costs for our owners so that they're around in 10 years and they're not facing the financial troubles with a building that leaks and, and doesn't respond you know, to the oil and gas prices the way it needs to. Talk a little bit, Jim, about the design process, if, if you would, the uniqueness of designing a lead uh, 
The process is, is actually very similar if you keep the mindset that we're sustainable and we're doing what's right by the environment and our clients and our partners with Brockford. Mm -hmm. we've, we've pulled together a team philosophy that really shows that you need to pull in sustainable issues and ideas and concepts early into programming where we do our programming and master planning. Then if you do it at the very front of the project, it sort of leaches all the way through and then is constructed and then the value's there for everybody for the next 50 to 100 years of the life of the building. Hmm. Hence sustainability, right? There you go. Yeah. So Shelley, uh -huh. if yeah, I could add to that, with, uh -huh. um, with our current project at uh, the Spartan Source YMCA that, that Jim and his company are, are putting together for us, we took a little bit different approach to lead on this project. And instead of starting with the scorecard, which is often done, we actually started on this project by setting the scorecard aside. And we worked with Design Plus to develop a building that best met our sustainable goals and our um, our longevity goals and our use goals throughout the facility. And in that process, then we took the scorecard and we applied that when we got done with the design process and found that we actually did extremely well. So we used the LEED system as a scoring system as opposed to a criteria for design system. And that was different um, in this project, the, the, the current Y, than our previous project, the downtown uh, YMCA. Mm -hmm. Where would uh, you come into play with either this project or just this? I mean, I've got you with soil materials and engineers. Where does the soil come into well, play? Uh, a project such as this nature, uh, the company I work for, we'd be involved from a standpoint of securing financial incentives if needed, mm -hmm. uh, working on the site design, working on below grade soil issues, really determining what the site conditions are, how they impact the overall development. And in most cases, my role would be to work and pursue financial incentives to offset those costs to help the development move forward. And in this day and age, this project, you know, projects aren't moving forward without some form of incentive or financial benefit. But uh, where the lead or the USGBC would get involved in projects of this nature would be from a standpoint of once, uh, as you stated with the scoring card, once that's completed, they've determined that they feel that they've obtained those particular credits then submitted to the U.S. Green Building Council and its you know, sub-entities to be reviewed and, and scored. Mm, very good. You're watching Ask the Sustainability Experts. We're going to take a quick five-second break, show you what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. Stay with us. And, of course, Community Connection, as you see, next up on our regular Thursdays. Thanks, as always, for being here. Ask the Sustainability Expert, Experts, a special segment for you on this last Thursday of December. Gentlemen, let's continue our conversation. You, uh, in your construction uh, career, again, lead. This was not here 20 years ago. Do you see, uh, you know, different discussions in the boardroom? Oh, absolutely. It's really evolved um, probably really kind of taken a big leap in the last probably three years where it's gotten a lot more specialized. They kind of had their early infancy of, of lead, kind of what's this new thing, people getting interested, and then people like Brett and, and the YMCA kind of, okay, this might be able to benefit me, I can save some money, um, and, and now we're sort of getting more specialized. We've got, we've got existing buildings, we've got new construction, we've got hospitals, we've got schools, and it's just really, it's really gotten more specialized and um, really just, be, you know, trying to find more people that I can benefit, I think, is really the evolution of the process. Mm -hmm. I think that if we look at the generations that we're affecting that are using the buildings, uh, Brett, yours with the YMCAs, and the children that are going to the recycling center now, that are really seeing firsthand where their waste goes and how it's collected and what happens to it, they're, they're horrified and, and ecstatic at the same mm -hmm. time because they feel like we're doing something with it that's responsible. So really that platform for getting the generations below us um, to see it early on, it'll be uh, rooted deeper in them than it is even in us. Mm, yeah. yeah I mean, my my three-year-old knows how to recycle. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing, yeah. you know? So great. it's great. Nice. Yeah. Challenges. What, what challenges, if I ask you that question, starting with you, Jim? Really, challenges, we, we are so grateful for owners like you, Brett, who put this as part of the program. Um, there, there is an awareness program that we take on with what is LEED, what is sustainability, and how does it relate to me and my project and the cost of my project. Is this going to cost me money? I don't want to jump the gun on mm -hmm. th that topic, but that's a very big deal, and it's, there are so many variables. 
that you have to have the belief that it's good for the community and good for you and your staff um, to, to take that and put it into the program where we start with it. Sue? Uh, a challenge? Uh, a challenge with it, I think, to go on along with Jim's comments, cost and getting over the perception uh, of how it impacts the project. And uh, you speak with a lot of individuals when you're in the planning stage of a project, and that's the first question that comes out of an owner or developer's uh, mouth in regards to what is the cost, what am I going to pay for it? And th it's difficult to, to state. The, there is a premium, some people say, of doing a lead project. But often when you look at that from a, a peer percentage or cost perspective, you're not taking into account what the savings will be or what the overall plan. Uh, Jim, you, you referenced earlier in regards to bringing a project together. A key part of doing a lead project is integrated design approach. It's where everybody comes together, they discuss the project, how their piece is going to fit together. And to a lot of people say, well, the development team should be doing that anyways. Well, in a lot of cases, they're not. You have different mm -hmm. specialties that are working in there. They're different spheres or towers, and there isn't a cost savings to that. So what lead I see immediately on projects, it allows for communication to occur uh, very quickly and early on in the process, which saves costs. And and it's tough to quantify that and articulate that to a developer that's never done a lead project. Brad, I assume that you've probably seen that in projects, the communication increase uh, just by doing those types of meetings. So it's, hmm. that's a big challenge. Yeah, Brett, follow up on that. And it really goes to, to Design Plus and Rockford's credit here, you know, particularly in my, in my direct experience, that, that that communication is so critical to, to educate us as owners of, of what our options are and to what we found at the YMCA is that lead doesn't necessarily cost additional money over building a quality building. Mm -hmm. If you're going to cut corners and try not to build a quality building, then certainly lead could add to your costs. And, and, and both Rockford and Design Plus have some great experts on staff that really helped us through that educational process, helped us sort out where we would see paybacks or where we would see values for implementing various sustainable initiatives in our buildings. And, and that's, that's a challenge if you have a design team and a, and a build team that doesn't have that educational horsepower. And it's an easily overcomable challenge that actually creates a giant benefit in, in the case of how our project is running. Hmm. Pete? You know, challenges, um, education of subcontractors, you know, really getting one of the benefits in this integrated design process we find with the, with the, with the lead process is really you're, you're you're just collaborating a lot more. You're talking through what what are you doing? You know, keep. I mean, this is like sweeping up after dirt after on a construction site. I mean, a construction okay. site is an inherently dirty site, but I mean, one of one of the things is maintenance during construction to limit dust. Get, you know, getting airborne. So, sure. just educating um, the subcontractors, and then one of the things we find as we um, you know Rockford does work in over 40 states and. The, the lack of education of the lead process in other areas, like we're doing some work in Florida and people, they mm. don't even know what the lead process is. It's, wow. it's kind of scary. Yeah. And just, we're just very fortunate really to be here and to have, I mean, I don't know too many people who have not worked on a lead project here. But you still have to educate them, like, and you yeah. co collaborate and it's, it's, it's ongoing. Right. So. He cleans yeah. up pretty well, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, uh, cha uh, we talk challenges, you want to expand on the cost? Well, the, mm -hmm. the cost, we factor in the value of the building, and the cost of the building has to include the first five years of operation. You could pick the number of years that you feel is appropriate, but at the same time, we aren't developing buildings where we need to flip them right away and expect that return on the investment. So if you have 39% of all the energy in the United States is used by our facilities, our buildings, and that's important. We spend 90% of our hours in buildings. So if you can use those stats to see that architecture and design and great construction practices make a difference, then people are going to be healthier and happier mm -hmm. and more comfortable. And it's not going to affect the bottom line as the utilities, Brett mentioned, maybe we're going to see another gas increase soon. You're going to probably have the savings long term mm -hmm. um, so that we're not really short-sighting the, the end goal of, of the financial efficiencies of a project. Yeah. Are, are those who own older homes, can they look for your services for any, you know, I guess, greening opportunities, Pete? Yes. All the mm -hmm. opportunities really that mm -hmm. are out there with, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the financial opportunities to, for 
um, and tax credits for insulation. I mean, just basic, you know, replacing your windows and mm -hmm. um, adding insulation. And you got a day left in the year to do it to get yeah. the tax credit this well, that's year. Right. So. Quickly, that's why we do these shows. That's right. uh, Steve, expand on that. Oh, mm -hmm. weatherization is a key part. It's uh, the tax credits that are out there right now for um, insulation, as Pete referenced, is a big part from you know, looking at your furnace to looking at your windows. Uh, I know we're, as we approach the end of the year here that they are going to expire, but the hope would be that uh, as Congress moves forward with evaluating you know, tax policies, that that's something to take a look at. Because I do know a lot of folks that have taken a look at their, their operations and say, how can we save? It, you know, it comes back to our early discussion that people are being hit with a lot of costs right now. And they're looking for ways to reduce their budget and really make it make their dollar count. And we're changing a light bulb, doing something to decrease uh, the amount of heat they're using are key portions of that. So I think you'll you'll see, and hopefully Congress sees that as well, and they'll take measures to continue those tax credits to help those folks. Hmm. Well, certainly not to overlook the healthy living side. Um, homeowners can select uh, low VOC, volatile mm -hmm. organic compound paints and materials to put in their homes. And oftentimes it's just a matter of choice, it's not a matter of cost. So if you're going to repaint a section of your home, um, choose low VOC products. If you're going to replace your carpet, work with your carpet provider to, to choose low VOC carpets. And these will increase the, uh, the health of people inside the home. And uh, when you increase your health, you help lower your health care costs as well as have a general better outlook on life and a better feeling. Hmm. I can be guaranteed to be healthy in one of your wives, too, Absolutely. right? Yeah, especially <laughs> knowing that. Let's uh, ask for a few more greening tips, please, Pete. Yeah, I think light bulbs are a key one. I mean, the fluorescent, compact fluorescent light bulbs, turn your thermostat down. Um, we just did that in our office. We went through a whole re-greening. We uh, re-insulated all the pipes. Uh, we're, I mean, we're just saving thousands of dollars a year, um, all new uh, fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, but you can do it in your office, in your house. I mean, pretty, mm -hmm. pretty easy things to do. Um, yeah, I think the thermostat's well, it, the key one. Thermostat, programmable thermostat, yeah. something that has a little intelligence. We talk a lot about building systems and the logics that go into running your, your furnace or how your hot water heater is looped mm -hmm. or energy recovery options that you might have for your furnace with pulling in fresh air from the outside. That, again, for indoor, indoor air quality and the healthy environment that you want for your family um, has as much to do with your actions uh, when you spend your money as as does the financial impact for buying the light bulbs. Yeah. I, I trust the appliances we purchase should match energy the star Energy Star. That's, impor yeah. that's yeah. important that's too. And, and don't forget recycling. At home it's yeah. very easy to recycle. Yeah. And so again, we talk to sustainability. Mm -hmm. and take advantage of your community's recycling program or, or create your own recycling program. And, and there's lots of opportunities to, to recycle both at home and, and commercially. Hmm. What else, Steve? What else do we need to make sure that the U.S. Green uh, building Council wants us to know? Uh, really active participation from membership. Um, with the honor and the privilege of being a region that has so many lead projects, the U.S. Green Building Council is always looking for additional volunteers to participate. Um, we recently did a uh, green building tours of West Michigan, which showcased 40 buildings throughout the region, and really began to take a look at how those buildings were performing. And it's become a, a benchmark for the the state as the United States as a whole as something that the U.S. Green Building Council out of Washington, D.C. was really impressed with and something they want to take to a national level. So with the uh, prestige of being one of the top cities in the, the nation for green building, I, I think there's uh, a responsibility associated with that. And that's really continuing the momentum that has been built and not just looking to lead to be the standard of how we do sustainability, but just looking overall at sustainability and how we can continue that into other facets of our daily life. Great. The profession of an architect, would you choose it again? Would you recommend it? Is there a job <laughs> out there for me? If I... Oh, no. Um, you know what? <laughs> I love what I do. I love this part of what yes. I do. And you have to have those intangibles when you're going forward in this economy because everybody is, is pinched right now. So we are making decisions at home and at my office that really you need to feel good about. And, and working on projects that give you that feeling back, like the YMCA, it helps. We know we're helping families, the community, and I, I absolutely would uh, choose this profession again and uh, working with these people. Right. So. Pete, you get to be on TV, too. Yeah. And you do get to be a spokesperson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
I ask you for a final oh, comment, Pete. Absolutely. I would do this in a second. I, I love it. I love watching things come out of the ground, being able to do just kind of the right thing consistently, work with just great projects. You know, mm -hmm. a year later, you just get to go back and say, hey, I built that. Bring your kids through there and just show them, you know, what, you, what you've done. It's just it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love it. Is the Spartan Y open? I mean, here we are, end of December. It will be opening uh, the, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. summer of 2011, so this coming summer. Mm -hmm. We're anticipating about June or July. Great. And the project is moving rapidly through construction, and it's going to be a, a great addition to our Grand Rivers YMCA's. Great. Looking forward to that ribbon cutting. Gentlemen, thank you so much for what you do, of course, for West Michigan with all, each of your talents and your own personal sustainability habits. It does take each of us to do our part, doesn't it? Absolutely. Great. Does. So thanks for your time, and Happy New Year. You can thank officially you say you. that. <laughs> and as too. always, thank you for your time, and Happy New Year. Thank you for sharing your Thursday nights with us, but we're here for you in 2011 at least. So have a good evening and a good New Year.